Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Uh, to celebrate the holidays, here's the giveaway for today's episode. The MAPS Super Bundle. This includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit, all in this bundle. And one of you will get it for free. All you got to do is leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get all those programs for free. Also, huge Black Friday sale going on right now. Now, all MAPS programs and all bundles, everything, 60% off. This is the biggest sale of the year by far. So if you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com, and it doesn't matter which program you choose, which bundle you choose, you can continue to use this code and get 60% off everything, even the already discounted bundles. Just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code Black Friday for that 60% off discount. And it's Black Friday with no space. All right, here comes the show. All right, so here's a crazy fact. Uh, men's testosterone levels have been declining about 1% a year since the 1980s. So there's a bit of a testosterone deficiency or low testosterone epidemic. By the way, the signs of low testosterone in men look like this, right? So low libido, low confidence, low motivation, excess fat gain from where you might not know where it's coming from, and muscle weakness. Now, here's something else that's crazy. It looks like a lot of women are suffering from this as well. Low testosterone in women, and believe it or not, women need testosterone as well. The signs are very similar. Low libido, low motivation, low confidence, muscle mass going down, excess body fat that seems to be unexplained. There are things you could do naturally to raise your testosterone, but there are also pharmaceutical ways you could balance out your hormones. All right, let's talk about this here. Now, this is I, a big, big, big issue. Yeah, yeah this has been an, uh, an issue for uh, for a while too, and I think that it, it took me a, a while to figure that out with clients. I remember, um, and it would only happen after I'd have a client who would go back and see their doctor and get blood work, and then they'd come back and they would tell me their testosterone levels. But I remember having clients that, you know, man, I they you, they seem to be following everything I said on the diet. They seem to be training, and you know, again, we talked about this before. Where we are a young trainer, you think they're lying to you? Mm -hmm. You know, like this client just got to be lying. They got to be sneaking Snickers bars or not doing the workouts I'm telling them to, or they got to be lying, and because they're not, their the their weight isn't changing. They're not losing the body fat. We seem to not be putting muscle on. Really, I've got all my things in line that I think I'm supposed to, but they're just it's they're not moving the needle. And then they would finally go see a doctor and get blood work done. And then I'd find out like my, you know, 50 year old engineer is at like, you know, free test is like at one, one something, you know, they're at the floor mm. as far as their uh, testosterone levels. And it, it plays a huge role. And then of course, going through what I went through from using testosterone, using steroids for so many years on and off, and then deciding, okay, I'm going to go off completely. Let's see if I can naturally get myself up to a healthy place. And I did that for almost three years, shared that story on the podcast. And man, it's when you go through it yourself, especially being someone who's in in the space and a fitness professional, uh, boy, can I tell what a difference uh, it is when you have low testosterone versus when it's just optimized. Mm -hmm. You know, like my, my hormone uh, therapist right now, we just... We're not taking a high dose at all. I just keep myself to where. Yeah, you're taking a therapeutic dose. This is in bodybuilding. Yeah, doses. so it's it doesn't. I don't feel like crazy strong. I don't feel like I'm taking a lot. I just feel good, and I can see a huge difference on the way my body responds when I, you know, turn the knobs, start training consistently, dial in the diet. My my body composition changes relatively quick versus when it was low. It seemed like I I could be perfect for weeks and see little to no change, and then the slightest mishap or you know off the diet, mm -hmm. and I would put on all this body fat. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like a vital uh, indication whether or not like you're you're in balance and, and you're healthy. Uh, and it's one of those things that I had to like rethink about testosterone because growing up in in playing sports, it was so demonized. It was so you know, look down upon in terms of like exogenous, you know, hormones. And, you know, at this point, because of the change of the environment, because of lots of factors, remember Carol Hooven yep. kind of brought this up in her book, 
uh, and it just really set off alarms. Like we're just in a different uh, landscape now that we really need to consider, you know, where, like go getting checked. Like where are my uh, levels at and, and what's what's the healthy ranges I should be, uh, you know, considering? Yeah, that. testosterone uh, was unfairly demonized, right? It was demonized because it's been used as a performance enhancing drug. And just like lots of, um, you know, medicines or prescriptions are abused, but testosterone really got demonized to the point where um, it's like bad for you. It's always bad for you. The truth is there's a range of, of, of levels of testosterone. And by the way, we should get into that, right? We should get into what that range means, but yeah. there is a range. Going below that range is very bad for your health. I mean, it increases your risk of cancers, dementia, diabetes, um, increases your risk of obesity, um, heart disease, even prostate cancer, which is sensitive to testosterone. When your testosterone is too low, they show that aggressive testosterone, uh, excuse me, prostate cancers can start to develop. So it shouldn't be demonized. It's also a very safe hormone to use, unlike other hormones that we prescribe, like insulin, for example, which you got to be very careful with. Um, so it is quite interesting. Now, as far as a low testosterone epidemic is concerned, there's been lots of speculation as to why. I and mean, this has been observed now for decades. For decades, we're just seeing these declining levels. And they're like, okay, we're less active. Mm -hmm. We're more, more obese. But w even when you count for those factors and you control everything, it doesn't account for how much it's gone down. And they think it has more to do with environmental factors, xenoestrogens and heavy metals and phthalates and pollutions. Yeah. And yes, exactly. There are teenagers. This is true now. I was researching this. There are teenagers now that are showing up with testosterone levels that 80-year-old men are supposed to have. Yeah. Teenage well, boys. Isn't well, that what that, that viral uh, article or the article that went viral was about? Was it, I think they compared like testosterone in, in like 20-year-old men today is at the same average level as a 60-year-old man just yeah. like 50 years ago or yep. something like that. Yeah, right? and, That's, and, and that's so, crazy. Yeah, and, and I, the way I feel about um, testosterone is the way I feel about all medical inter interventions. Does it improve your health and does it improve your quality of life? Um, and in in that case, then yes, I think it's something that could be beneficial. This is for all medical interventions, right? And I do think it's important that you try to lead a healthy life so that your body is optimized naturally. But in many cases, you do that and you're still, like you had experienced, Adam, or like clients I've had in the past, still really low. And so now it's a matter of quality of life and health. In which case, okay, it makes sense for supplemental testosterone. And women, if, if testosterone was demonized for men, mm -hmm. it's even more so for women, right? Yeah. It's like, oh my God, if you take testosterone, you're going to change your, your gender. You're going to grow a penis. Which is so hairy. funny because I remember when I was a kid, my mom, when she had her hysterectomy, that's they had to put her on testosterone. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And it's it's prescribed all the time uh, it's just for women for special it's cases. Much like lower dose. Yeah. Right? But the signs for women are also now. Here's this is just an anecdote, but I know someone now who's a female who has gotten TRT, right? So she's gotten hormone replacement therapy, mm -hmm. testosterone primarily, has gone through a doctor. Now we're she's about eight weeks in, and she's like, "I wish I did this ten years ago." So I feel so much better. I have way more, and she was a fit, healthy person, so she wasn't like, "This isn't like a couch potato eats like garbage," and then decides to go on testosterone. She was doing everything. And she was like, man, I just couldn't understand. I thought it was because I was getting older. She went on testosterone. And again, they bring you within a healthy range. They're not, they're not these super physiological crazy doses. And she's like, I, I would have done this before. Had I known how I would feel, I would have done this before. So this is a big deal. And I think we're going to see, I predict testosterone is going to get rescheduled. Right now it's scheduled. Um, I think it's a schedule three drug and it's, you know, it's kind of tightly regulated. I think they're going to loosen up because oh, you can see how, epidemic. you can see oh, how it's yeah. loosening up already. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't that long ago that there, the only way you get it was through your general practitioner and they didn't want to do it unless you were deathly sick from low testosterone. And now you're starting to see these HRT clinics popping up mm -hmm. all over the place. So I think that the pendulum is starting to swing back that. And the, and the conversation has changed. There used to be a stigma around it yeah. that was really bad. Oh, my God, steroids, bad. You know, like, like the old drug it's, commercials. It's so crazy because yeah. this is how uh, in interesting it is, right? Um, women go on birth control all the time. No big deal. Which is these are estrogen or progesterone type uh, hormones that they're taking. Men demonize, stigmatized for taking testosterone, which is a far, by the way, it's a far safer hormone to take 
Then, That's the then, irony of it. Isn't it interesting? Well, it just shows you that how the, the power of media and, totally. and the way that we can promote something or demonize something by the conversations that we're having or how we structure those conversations. And I, I, I want to believe that it's changing. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited for, I mean, the first time that we brought it up on the show years ago, um, I was blown away by the amount of young men that were DMing me. Mm-hmm. That said, that heard heard me talk about my experience. They went and got their blood work. They're 23, 25, and they're like, oh, my levels were 240 or my levels were 180. And like yeah. these numbers that were so low for someone that young. And I, I just, I'd never seen that in my, my previous 10 years of being a personal trainer. That wasn't a common thing that I heard. Uh, I saw that in my 50 year old engineer and my, you know, advanced age clients uh, had hormone stuff as they naturally decline as you get older. But I didn't see that in these young men. I see that now today. And so I think because of that, I think you're going to see this space grow rapidly. It's already exploded. And, it's so much bigger already. And I love, I love, um, you know, I'm really excited for our audience, for the things that we're putting together, uh, you know, to, to help and support people that are unsure or curious about it, that want to learn more. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we always lead with that, right? So mm-hmm. at, adding value first. And so, you know, we opened up this forum uh, a couple of months ago, we don't really talk about it. It's a, a MP Hormones forum on Facebook, uh, and it's it, we were going to originally do it private for anybody that's going through the hormone therapy. And as we talked more and more about, it, I said, you know what, we're getting so many questions related to this that instead of us, you know, only helping out these people that are already going through the hormone therapy that have the doctor, why don't we open the forum up? Let's see if we can get Dr. Rand and his team to come in and have these conversations and, and live. Yeah, so, so regenerative and sport medicine is the clinic that, in, in, that we work with and we work with them because uh, we like them the best. They know their stuff the most. They're also very keen on, and, and they really pay attention to how people feel. So Here's the challenge with in, in the past with uh, hormone replacement therapy, or at least testosterone. The range of what's considered normal is huge, right? It's 300, depending on the lab you go to, but generally it's about 300 to 1100. So that's the range. And, and so if you're at 330 or 340, in the past, your doctor was like, well, you're within range, you're okay. Even if you have all the symptoms of low testosterone or let's say you're at 400 or 500 and you have all these signs of low testosterone, they'd be like, yeah, you don't need testosterone. You're somewhere in the middle. What we know now is it's much more complicated than that, right? You have androgen receptor density, which makes a big difference. In fact, there was a study that compared testosterone levels in men and strength gains. And they found that so long as the testosterone wasn't like too extreme, there wasn't any difference in strength gain. What they found the difference in strength gain was due to was the androgen receptor density. So, hmm. 500 testosterone, which is you know near lower lower testosterone than let's say 800. If you're at 500, but you have a lot of androgen receptors, you're going to feel way better than someone with 800 with really low androgen receptor density. So, what regenerative and sport medicine does is they say, okay, here's your levels. Let's look at all these other hormones as well and all these other symptoms. And then how do you feel? How do you feel? Do you feel okay? Are you noticing a difference? If not, then let's see if we can move this up to the point where your quality of life, uh, you know, is, is back to where you want it to be, now which I, I think is important. Now, mm-hmm. I know you've been kind of overseeing this side of the business and you have got them to come on. Uh, is it twice a month they're going to start coming on the forum? Yeah, and- so I, I have it written up here. So, okay, so we have a forum on Facebook called MP Hormones. It's, it's actually Mind Pump Hormones. Excuse me, Mind Pump Hormones. And it's a Facebook group, and we have opened it to everybody. Okay, so I don't know how long we're going to keep. By the way, it's open and free for anybody. If yeah. you get in now, you're in there for life for free. Don't know if we're going to keep it that way forever, but well, nonetheless, you can get in there. It's free, and on uh, December eighth and December twentieth at five p.m. Pacific, Doctor Rand and Doctor Todd, those are both doctors from regenerative and sport medicine, are going to get on there, and they're going to answer. Any questions at all people have about hormones, hormone replacement therapy. This is for men and for women. So you can get on there. It doesn't matter. And you can ask them whatever questions you want. And you'll be talking to, in our opinion, the best people um, in the business. Yeah, I know there's just a lot of reservations out there because I don't think people really understand. I mean, it's complex. It's a complex topic talking about hormones. So I'm sure there's tons of questions before you want to really make a a first step to try and get, you know, some kind of help and therapy in that direction. So, you know, that's why I think it's important to have the conversations first. And this is a great place to do that. Dude, it's it's totally a quality of life thing. What you're not going to do is you're not going to go and get, 
you know, and this is just for people who might not know, okay? Bodybuilding doses, the kind that are demonized or, or what demonized testosterone, very different from therapeutic doses. So a, a high a highish therapeutic dose of testosterone would be around 200 milligrams a week, maybe, you know, every 6 days or something like that. That's a highish uh, replacement therapy dose. Bodybuilders do not take yeah. 200 milligrams of testosterone. They're taking 1000 plus other anabolic steroids plus growth hormone or more. So this is not the same at all. You're not you're not in that kind of bad, dangerous kind of levels of hormones where you get these things you got to watch out for. What you're doing with with a hormone replacement clinic that's really good is they're just optimizing. And again, this is for people who are just like, look, I, in my opinion, the best candidates for this are people who are already health conscious and have a history of you know being relatively fit and are just like, what is going on? Why do I feel, I mean, for men and for women, leads to depression. And sometimes they're like, why do I feel so depressed? Then they'll go on other drugs to help with depression when it's a hormone thing that they could solve through you know supplemental testosterone. And again, women, same thing. I don't want women to be afraid. It's just a much smaller dose. But again, they keep you within that normal Well, I'm range. glad you said, my, that's my recommendation. I'm getting so many DMs and I'm so glad that you set this up for them. And that's, it's not just these two dates, right? Is this something you got them to commit these to? These are the first two dates, but we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing two every month is the goal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I'm just getting flooded by these questions and I'm just like, I'm not qualified to be answering or telling you or directing you. The one thing that I have, have recommended to everybody, and it's the same thing that I did uh, first before I did, which is I do think that the responsible thing to do is to kind of check the boxes yourself first naturally to yeah. make sure that you're 100%. not just masking other issues. So if you have chronic stress and you have chronic bad sleep and, and you eat like shit, you eat yeah. like shit and you just, you've got a lot of things else going on with you. And then you just decide, Oh, I'm going to throw testosterone on that. And it will help. It'll make you feel a lot better, but you're just masking other issues. I think it's important mm -hmm. that you kind of assess those things first and see, Hey, if I never get good sleep, what happens when I get good sleep for a week? Maybe you feel a lot better. I'm so glad you said that. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point because testosterone is a feel good hormone. Hormone, no matter what. So you go on testosterone, even if you live a shitty lifestyle, you're going to notice that, oh, I feel a lot better. Oh, my libido is a lot higher. Here's the one of the potential drawbacks of, of, of hormone replacement therapy. And I've, I've had ex this experience with clients. Natural testosterone levels fluctuate based on your lifestyle. So if you're a healthy man with good testosterone, let's say you're a healthy guy, testosterone is pretty consistent, 800, 900. You've got good androgen receptor density and you're, everything's great. But then you just, you know, let's say you have a baby and you're just not sleeping and you stop working out. Oh, my diet's going to crap. Well, now your testosterone might dip down to 500 because everything's well, off, it's, right? It's not a might. It's almost certain, right? Right, right. But just I'm using a hypothetical. Yeah, now yeah. let's say you're on hormone replacement therapy. No matter what you do, your testosterone is going to be high. Mm -hmm. So it could mask a shitty lifestyle. And this is where I've seen people, like for example- I had a client, he was 45, and we did the same. Adam, very similar to what you said. We were training, uh, we were looking at his diet, doing everything, and he's like, man, I used to, like five years ago, he's like, I used to respond so different. And I'm like, as a trainer, I'm trying to figure everything out. Mm -hmm. Luckily, he's one of those clients that just did everything I said. So it was like perfect, because I could say, okay, well, it's not this, it's not that. So then I said, well, on your next physical, let's get your hormone levels checked and see what's going on. So he did, he went got his hormone levels checked and they came back at about, I think it was like 300 or it was like at the, at the bottom. He went on hormone replacement therapy, felt amazing. And then he made this big mistake. He decided, Oh, that means I'm going to, you know, double or triple the volume of my training now <laughs> because, and I'm like, no, 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 that doesn't work that way. Let's stay the course, see how you feel. It's not a magic pill or potion and you can overtrain and still make yourself feel like crap, even though your hormones now are optimized. So it's not magic. Uh, but you'll still feel better, but it's not magic. But if you do everything good and then your hormones are optimized and then you optimize them, I mean, it's it's a huge it's nice improvement. icing on the cake. Huge improvement in quality of life. Well, so. al along the lines of this drug talk, I'm just going to keep us in the drug space where we're here. Did you guys see the um, uh, opioid deaths? So deaths from things like- Exploded. 29% increase over the last 12 months. Is this months. Uh, because That's of fentanyl? It's it's because of the lockdowns and the mm. and the stressful environment. Oh, how dare you tie yeah, it to that? No, wow. you're gonna get hey, crucified for that. All one. suicide, all suicide yeah, that's, yeah. exploded. 
yeah. all suicides across yeah. the board. Kids suicides. Yeah, this isn't even like technically suicide. This is just in in, in general, right? Or like uh, no, this uh, is opioid over over over. Yeah, yeah, well, right. so this is like everywhere. Like there, because I know there was some there was some place. I don't know if like in the Midwest it was becoming like really a big problem, like the opioid uh, crisis there, and then fentanyl was a big part of that. Well, there's order. different places in the country that the the restrictions or the ability, I guess, to to get a hold of it is easier or more difficult than others. So I, I compare the, um, I know I heard Florida's got a really, yeah, loose Florida, market. Florida was really loose, which it makes sense, right? You have a lot of people yeah, in advance. Elderly. It's like the oldest population yeah. is in Florida. They're probably the most likely the, the yeah, best. I read kind. people will go to one doctor, get a prescription, go to another doctor, get a prescription. That's right. Yeah. So, and, and that's been a hustle for, uh, quite some time. The, the laws over here are a lot stricter than over there. And there's, I'm sure if state to state, it varies on how much they crack down on that. It's very similar to what you see of marijuana. Marijuana in California, not a big deal. If someone yeah. gets, gets a prescription, walking down the street with marijuana wouldn't be a big mm -hmm. deal. Uh, you go somewhere else in the country and it's people freak Only out. Only difference is there's never been an overdose of marijuana. Well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. You ain't going to die. For, you, the only way you'll That's die from marijuana part. is if you if someone drops like a, a thousand pounds of it on your head. Uh, otherwise, I don't <laughs> think you, can, you could die from it. But it's uh, all suicides have gone up. Um, alcohol use, cigarette use, uh, mm -hmm. junk food, all, all that because it's been a very stressful time lockdowns, uncertainty, fear. And so it just drives this, you know, self -medic -medic medication. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too, that it's not, it's not a constant conversation that we're having because I was reading, I think it was the same article, maybe a different one, but I was going down the kind of the rabbit hole and I didn't know that we have been on a 26 year run of record breaking years every year. Mm -hmm. So for 26 years straight, we can for opiate yes overdose yeah yeah it just keeps going up and going up and going up and going up and going up. Nothing's changed. Nothing. No. Wow. So it's it's crazy though that it doesn't get talked it's about alarming. as much as as as, yeah. like, as a lot of other things get talked yeah, about. Yeah. What right? upsets me is that when we pass policy, public policies and laws, we only look at one metric and we don't consider potential other downstream effects or side effects. Like if we say shut everything down, lock everybody down, reduce infection, but then we don't consider, well, are people going to feel isolated? What about people on the brink? There's a lot of, so a lot of suicides that jump in suicides isn't happy people who committed suicide. It was people who were kind of on the line and they were a little bit like, oh, I'm not good and I'm kind of depressed. And then this happens and it pushes them over the edge. And that's what you see. Yeah. You see all those people over the edge that not get pushed over. And then stuff like this happens. So it's uh, yeah, the psychological really ramifications of all these things. Like I really wish that the policymakers would spend a little more time thinking their way through. They you know? don't. You know. What, you know what it reminds me of? It's kind of similar, but obviously different topic. Uh, I listened to the podcast with uh, Joe Rogan and Peter Atia. Did you guys listen to this? Mm -hmm. I haven't listened to that one yet. Uh -uh. So really good, Doug. Peter Atia. He's an exercise and nutrition scientist. I think if you wouldn't mind looking up his. Uh, anyway, really smart guy. Um, I love hearing hearing the guys, uh, you know, take on exercise and health and fitness. Super smart guy. But the only critique I have is the same critique I have for other scientists and scholars. Yeah. yeah, in the fitness and health space, is that when they give their advice, they don't consider the context of the average person. Like and behaviorally. What, yeah, they don't. Right. Yeah. So he's on Rogan and he's talking about like the best ways to improve uh, longevity. And this is really interesting. Doug, what is this? He's a physician. Okay, so so he basically is doing research. He's science. Uh, very smart guy. Okay, so so I thought. So when you're when you're when you're advising people on the best practices for health and fitness, a scientist or a researcher tends to give you the most effective thing that research has shown. They don't consider is it appropriate? Are people going to do it? Is this actually going to work? It's basically just like. So here's what he said. Right, he said. First of all, I, th I found this very interesting. Being fit reduces your all-cause mortality by five times, which he said there's no medical intervention that even comes close. Hmm. In fact, being fit and having a good diet, so fitness with good nutrition, will reduce your all-cause mortality more than smoking will increase it. And then to take it a step further, if you just exercise and are fit and have good ath athletic performance, that'll reduce your all-cause mortality more than diabetes will increase it. So that's how powerful being wow. fit is. But then when he gets into the exercise recommendations, he's like, yeah, you know, like three hours a week of super intense cardiovascular training oh, right. to improve your VO2 max and this and that. And I'm like, listen, no one's going to do that. 
A You're, lot of these biohackers love that because it's like all about like the short window. I could get cram in as much as possible. Yes. And it's like easier to sell. Yes. And it's just, and it's also inappropriate for a lot of people. Yeah. I'm not going to have is. the average person max out on a stationary bike and sprint like crazy because it's totally inappropriate for them. Plus, we don't know the levels of stress and is it going to contribute to that? Um, so that's the one critique I have is that he's communicating in that way. Was that the, I mean, was that his major message was pushing high intensity cardio, hard through? intensity, cardio strength training. And then it was like, you know, can you hang from a bar for two minutes and, you know, high intensity with resistance training? Cause studies show that that's what okay, works Okay. Wait best. a second. If he's, if he's advocating for three hours of cardio, where's the resistance? So you it, add more. Oh, so and you're talking adding and you're five adding days, six yeah. days a week yep. of, or, oh, <laughs> yeah, good luck. Yeah, I know. That's yeah, the good, that's the thing. It's, yeah, this is the example I always give is like, if you ask a researcher, an expert who researches fitness and nutrition, and you say, <laughs> what's the most effective form of exercise? They're going to tell you what the research, research says. If you ask an experienced coach or trainer, they're going to ask you first, which form do you enjoy doing the most? Exactly. Right? Because we know that's the one you're going to be consistent yeah, doing. it's all about behavior for longevity like what, what you're going to adapt to and, and stick with you yes. know, long term it, versus like what what plays out well in a lab and that you can see kind of the metrics of it but you know that's not sustainable no it's also quality of life um you know eating perfectly on paper would improve your longevity for sure right right amount of calories right around po you know perfect mm. proteins perfect uh calories like i said carbs fats nutrients all that stuff but what if eating perfect uh, was a, a major stress on your life? What if it was dysfunctional? What if you, you, you know, didn't have relationships with people around? You didn't go to events and isolated yourself to eat perfectly. Right. Then is it going to improve your longevity? No. Mm. Now it's probably there's a detriment to you know yeah. what you're doing. I That's why it's us, important. Yeah, I want to take us back to the apocalypse, uh, <laughs> just because I'm concerned uh, with, with the world, uh, and especially because like. You know, places like Egypt, you know, these are like biblical places. You're mm -hmm. just like, wow. Uh, they, they still have plagues, apparently. What? Yeah. What do you mean? So they just went through this. There's this place called Aswan. I, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but there's a, a city in Egypt that just experienced like this crazy flood and lightning and storms. And um, so meanwhile, they were like trying to just focus on COVID vaccines, all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. They had to shift completely because uh, this storm basically knocked out all, everybody's power and as a result of that, they got like these crazy like infestation of scorpions what? and like some snakes. And it's been, it stung like 450 people. Three what? people died. They don't have enough antivenom uh, to treat, you know, these people. And like they're telling people like steer clear of anywhere where there's these like palm trees or things where they live. And then because they're just out in numbers and droves. So I imagine it's the weather and the storm it's, that's It's causing. bringing them in for shelter. And oh, so they're, wow. they're trying to find shelter and they're like invading, you know, these poor people's houses. You imagine a bunch of scorpions just come out of nowhere. Like how terrifying. Well, and I imagine the ones over there look like crazy ones, not like the little ones we see here in, you know, California and yeah, stuff that are like fat. little tiny, they're... little tiny things. See, now this is terrifying. Like if you told me. Yeah, the locusts are coming next, dude. Yeah, oh no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the yeah. way, locusts the... and boils and, you know, like we know, we know yeah. the story. Paint, paint the, what do they, what do you put above your door? Like, yeah, yeah we got to paint blood over the door and like hope the angel <laughs> death way, doesn't kill me. Locusts Locusts still swarm and do wow. shit like that, right? 500 still, people yeah. hospital. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 500 people are hospitalized. That would I terrify mean, that's me. That's a lot, dude. Well, if you I guys was, have if, seen those videos the of the, the locusts, like when they, when there's a certain time of year when they all travel from one direction. Have you ever seen those clouds yes. of them like, traveling? They look crazy. Yeah, there's like billions of them. Yeah. And they'll just decimate crops or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this, see, this would terrify me. If, if there was all of a sudden like, oh my God, guys, uh, there's a scorpion plague coming to San Jose, like that would get me to move. I wouldn't. I'd be like, I'm out of here, dude. Sorry, guys. I'm if, if that gone. hit the news, I bet you wouldn't even believe it. Like, yeah. you would even. No, that's not true. That's not happening. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the the whole murder hornet thing, you know, had me had my cackles up a bit. But nothing really kind of happened with that. But if that would have been a thing, where all of a sudden murder hornets are like everywhere, you're walking and stinging you. Yeah. That'd have been a problem. Yeah, wasn't there like a, a isn't there a time of year in some places in Australia where they get so infested with spiders? 
that the trees and the plants are yeah. all oh same, yeah I shared that white. I shared that picture on uh, on here one time right we so many about that. webs and everything that it's just it takes over like areas the ground and yeah. all the trees it's it's like trippy. a whole park is just covered in webs yeah yeah that would <clears> freak me <throat> out no dude. thanks I'm cool <laughs> that's I'm, when you'd I'm see me cool with a flamethrower <laughs> Doug, <laughs> yeah. Doug would you say because uh, you've been on this earth longer than all of us um, <laughs> would you would you say uh, this is a uh, one of the weirdest times ever. Like when you look at our economy, when you look at, you know, scorpion stinging and, and killing yeah. people here, like mm -hmm. just everything that's going with housing prices, stock market stuff going, crypto, NFTs, like is it comparable to any other Yeah, uh, time and is there yeah, anything that you can go you like, can well, it was of, kind yeah. of crazy during this time. Okay. I haven't lived that long, uh, by the way. <laughs> you know, he's, he's like the roaring twenties, like was that weird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, in twenty nine when the the stock market crashed, that uh, was pretty traumatic. Uh, uh, no, the truth is, it's it's crazy right now. I've yeah. never seen it like this. I, I mean, I feel like we're in a really bad movie where they took all these different plots and said, "Hey, let's make one movie. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. Throw, let's it all throw it all together." Plot. We're in some we're in some video game with a like yeah. a like a, like the, a the simulation is glitching. Yeah, there's like yeah. a 13 year old playing us right now, and he's like, "I'm bored." Hit yeah, <laughs> maybe that's I, what metaverse is all all really about. Is like it, it we're already in it. And it's like, this is how we're going to reveal it to people is make them think we create it. Yeah, and then one yeah. day we'll be like, just you know, kidding, you're already in it. <laughs> okay, but you know what, though? You're if, creating yourself. If you're being objective, ah. if you want to be objective, the truth is this is nowhere near the craziest it's been in the last 60, 70 years. The differences were so aware. Like you had, first off, the Cold War, where there were moments where we were one button away from thermonuclear global war. Right. And, and that happened quite a few times. Then you had the oil embargo where if your car ended, if your license ended in an odd number, you could get gas on these days. If it ends in an even number, you can get gas on these hours long waits in line, unemployment through the roof. Like, I feel like we feel like this is a crazier time, but I, maybe it's just because we're more you don't aware. Think, you think that? Mm -hmm. I, I think this should, even now is worse than then. You don't you don't Could, think so? How do you think people respond if, if right now the government said well, we're you getting can't information get gas. a lot easier? Yeah. The, before that, I think that's probably part of it because we're just taking on too much of everybody. In the I mean, world. I don't disagree with that. That plays a huge role in the the panic and then how everybody feels about what's going on. But I mean, I I, I don't know. Like with COVID and everything, like I just feel like that is. How do you think people would respond today if we had a Cuban Missile <clears throat> Crisis, but with China? What if all of a sudden? Biden gets on and, you know, he's like, hey, we located Chinese nuclear missiles. I feel like at this Cuba. point, everybody would be like, yep, I knew this was coming too. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> super, logically, this is, this is yeah, I feel like this makes sense. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? That's why I, I, feel I like that's prefer how you the, the revealing of like Bro, the alien invasion. That'd that would be my Doug, preference. wasn't there an Olympics that we banned, we, we couldn't go to because uh, terrorists kidnapped a bunch of Olympic athletes? And was that the Berlin Olympics? Maybe I'm not sure. There was some type of a oh, event you're that took about place. The, uh, no, it starts with the letter M. What the, the are you talking about with the, the soccer players? I Munich. Don't know. Yeah, Munich. is that the Munich yeah, story? I, Munich, I, there was just there was a lot. We had uh, people getting assassinated all over the place. Like you had celebrities and political leaders getting assassinated. I don't think it's crazy. We had. Well, you, civil disobedience that makes what we have now look like nothing yeah. back in the in the 70s. We well, if you that. think back, we did have two wor world wars in the 20th that's century. True. So that, I mean that's that's pretty I mean we're fortunate not to be doing that right that's now. That's true. And we don't have a draft. I don't yeah. know anybody that like was forced to go. And that and that also to your point, like it, imagine if we went through a world war with social media right now. How fucking weird would that be? Oh, everybody would Shoot. be crying. Right. It would be a lot different than probably what it was like yeah. back then. I couldn't right? imagine if they just said right now, "Hey guys, you you, you can't get gas uh, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays if your license ends in an odd number. Or I couldn't imagine what it would be like to go get gas and have to wait two hours. How do you think people react right now? If you had to go get gas and wait two hours in line yeah. to get gas. Well, you've already seen it. Like people filling things up and every, every time something happens where there's a supply chain thing, you yeah. just see people in droves like well, doing crazy stuff. Didn't we just hit a record? California aren't we, did. Yeah, aren't we yeah. at an all-time yeah, an average four eighty four dollars did it! Cents? Yeah! <laughs> All time place. high. I know it's dude. not slowing down. You know, although I, uh, on a positive note of all this, you know, drama we're talking about right now, I did hear that the uh, supply chain issues is supposed to be loosening up, and that the fear of shelves are going to be empty for Christmas and stuff like that is not true. Like, you know, like Target and some of your big places are saying that we're up, you know, seventeen plus percent in inventory, oh, okay. and we have more than enough to carry dude. through the holidays. 
Yeah. So that's the the rumor is that it's not going to be as scary and Dude, as bad as what people. I learned a to. hack, by the way, for holiday shopping. Oh, I saw. Did Jason send that to you too? May, I think so. The thirty days with Costco. Yeah. Or? So yeah, yeah. so like Black Friday, right? There's like big sales and everything. But one of the challenges is like you go to you know Best Buy or or Costco, the computer and the TV that's super cheap. If you're not there in line first, it's gone. They're gonna have like ten on the floor and they're gone. Yeah. That's why people fight over them. So what this lady said, which I thought was brilliant, is most of these stores have a price matching, 30-day price matching guarantee. Yeah. So buy it before Black Friday, spend extra money. Then when it goes on sale, you just tell them, hey, I want to pay the, the cheaper price to refund you the balance. So I saw that, right? And then the thing that that I thought right away was like, yeah, but you know what? I bet you, like if you go to- got to make it a hassle for you to come back. Well, well so that. this is how I think they would make it a hassle is let's say, uh, you know, TV, since that's one of the most popular ones, right? And you mm -hmm. go, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to go buy the new- Sony, whatever, yeah. you know, HD 80 inch for, you know, five grand or whatever right now. And then when the Black Friday sale comes, I'm going to go trade out. Except for that Sony 10X5 model is the, now the Black Friday sale is on the Sony 11X6 model. And your model is not the one that went on sale. So when you try and go do the- Oh, so the, you guessed the wrong one? Yeah. <clears throat> or the, or it, they didn't even have the one that they sell just for Black Friday. A lot of people hold whatever it is that they're going to launch or release or sell on- Oh, why you got to ruin this? Cool yeah, hack? because <laughs> I, I mean, in theory, I thought it was really cool. I got the same t I got the same text message. I was like, oh, that's really smart. But it's yeah. like, oh yeah, what how, that's, I know that these companies are smart. They probably go, what we'll do is we'll- Launch something different on the actual Black Friday date. Uh, so then you think you're being all clever and you got yourself a hell expensive TV. You don't get it. I know. That's, that <laughs> they give you the ones that don't normally sell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what, though? TVs are way cheap compared to what they used to be. Oh, I, I saw it's some crazy. TVs. I did go to Costco recently. Super thin, incredibly clear. Do you guys remember when the first, like, quote unquote, flat TVs came out? And they were like over ten thousand, yeah, ten fifteen thousand dollars for like a little forty fifty inch. <laughs> yeah, I just bought not that long Let's ago. See. I bought a forty inch little like LCD screen for my bathroom for like when I was taking a bath. I told you guys about that. It's a like little forty yeah, little, yeah. weighs like a pound. It's so light. I think I paid two hundred bucks. Yeah, <laughs> it's so crazy. That's cr it's way crazy. Two hundred and it's like good good quality. It's nice. Yeah. Like, That's why I always have reservations about buying like electronics because it's just like you can't ever win though. Yeah, you, win, right? win, yeah. you wait and wait, and then the, the new model you comes can't out. Wait and, now, yeah, but it's yeah, always no. cheaper. Immediately. No, no. Like, yeah. like the next day. Dude, yeah, that's true. Do you, uh, did you guys see uh, the news on? Um, uh, Crypto, cryptocurrency.com or crypto.com, that company that's getting popular. I don't know if you guys have seen the Wait, they changed their name to crypto.com. Is that's that what you're talking about? The, the Staples Center. Staples Center. Staples Center there paid $700 million. Someone paid them. What do you mean? Who, wait, who no, paid $700 Crypto.com paid, paid Staples Center $700 million to change the name to wow. crypto.com. Is it wow. cryptocurrency or crypto.com? I have it in my notes. It says crypto. Crypti. Oh, com. that's just is that right? That's someone. That might be that's a typo. Crypto.com. Oh. Yeah, crypto.com. Okay. Seven hundred million dollars to have that, and I'm seeing the commercial. I don't know if you guys, uh, my ads on my uh, YouTube channel commercials when I'm watching streaming, it like Bitcoin did cryptocurrency. You know, did you know there's one place? I think one or two places in the world hmm. where where businesses and people prefer to use Bitcoin over the currency. Where, where? El Salvador and Venezuela. Where oh. if where people prefer because the cash is the money so messed up over there, yeah, that they actually prefer that you use uh, Bitcoin. That makes sense over I mean, that. Yeah, when your crypto's kind of crypto's here to stay. I just don't know which one. I mean, I think I think we could safely say Bitcoin is the gold. Yeah, but right? who's buying Bitcoin? It's fifty thousand or sixty I something thousand. 60 now. No yeah, one's yeah, buying Bitcoin. I mean, very the, the rich you're not are buying one. Yeah, you're buying pieces. Yeah, I mean, I don't, and even then, I don't know if there's a lot of people do that. I, the at least in in my circle of people that I know, everyone's speculating on the you know the XRPs and the, all the different the coins, Shiba. Litecoin, yeah, the Shibas, whatever, the Litecoins, yeah. the yeah, because they're still Doge playing coin. that. They're still playing that game. I'm talking about just big. It's I would bet that the one that's going to stick around, the one that's most likely to be used. Uh, as currency, the one that's most likely to be liquid <clears throat> is Bitcoin, right? That's the safest bet, I think, is... Uh, okay, uh, now, like, let's see if I got trolled or not, but somebody told me that there was, like, a Let's Go Brandon uh, crypto. Wow. <laughs> I was like, no way, dude. Wow. No way. I'll that's that. what I heard. 
I heard that. Did I bring up on the podcast the the five the top five songs in the in the yeah, iTunes? You did. Oh, okay, I was yeah. gonna say I, it's so crazy where that's going. The, yeah, the whole let's go Brandon thing. I, I can't. I was believe. like, they're gonna make currency out of this too. This is this is crazy. Yeah. Hey, I, I, did you guys hear that they're now engineering milk? They're gonna make milk without cows. Have you heard of this? We just saw a billboard on the milk that's not. It's called not milk. Is that what it is? No, no, no. This they're saying is milk. How does oh, that there's a brand called physically possible. There's a brand called not milk, and I saw a massive billboard on it when we were. Where were we just heading? Oh, we so it's a name. startup company. There's a startup company that raised 13 million dollars to make dairy products not from animals, but rather from microorganisms. Well, how's it considered dairy then? So it's a Tel Aviv-based startup called Imagine Dairy. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> nice dairy. job, guys. That's Cute. Cute. That's clever. So listen, what Cute. they're going to do instead. I'm going to read that. this to you. Instead of milking a cow to get cow's milk, the scientists of the company insert <laughs> DNA instructions for we the production bacteria. <laughs> for the production of whey and casein into microorganisms. So they have chosen these two components as they are principal milk proteins. So they take DNA, put it into these microorganisms. The microorganisms then produce whey and casein. Then they add plant-based fat, sugar, and water to the mix, and boom, you got milk. Magic. Imagine. Real milk, no cows. Imagine yeah. dairy. You know Is what, it a startup right now? That's crazy, dude. Yeah. It's a Tel Aviv-based uh, company. I wonder now, what it tastes like. Now, because it's got the plant-based kind of like fats and everything else, um, it's, it's obviously not the same, but it's got whey and casein made from bacteria. Yeah. How wild is that? It's wild. I know. But I know, mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I have a different advance. I have a different view on on things like this now after our conversation with our buddy Zach Same. at Zbiotics. Yeah. yeah. I do have a different look on it. Like just I I don't know enough or I didn't know enough about GMO to really it's it, it has such a bad name attached yeah. to it, at least in the health and wellness space. Yeah. That there's ah anti everything GMO, but the when because listening to him talk about where all that, all that science is going and how amazing it potentially can be, it's dude, you could theoretically you could program bacteria to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. So you'll program bacteria to make medicines and drugs and it's hard to fathom foods. Yeah. It's going to be, it's kind of weird. I mean, yeah. how do you feel? I do, at least I, my outlook on it is different after that conversation. Okay. So mm -hmm. here's, here's what I think. I, uh, first off, uh, there's, there's real benefit in the fat that comes from dairy and the sugar that comes from dairy is different than maybe the ones from plants. So I don't think it's going to be completely equivalent. However, if getting bacteria to produce whey encasing protein becomes extremely inexpensive and makes it easy, easily accessible to the world, yeah. we could solve some serious problems. Sure. Right? If you're if you're in a part of the world where it's hard to come by quality protein and you're nutrient deficient or whatever, and actually having cows, milking cows costs X amount of dollars, and you could save fifty percent of that. By doing it with you bacteria, get all the beneficial fats and amino acids. You get all the you know, protein. Like if you can have all that from that the production from bacteria, that's pretty damn interesting. Yes. How scared are you though? If you're like a dairy farmer, that's your livelihood, and it's been that way for you know multiple generations. Like what if the, seeing news, yeah, like this. What mean, if the future the, is going to be like this? Like wealthy people, like you're going to go to a super expensive restaurant, and they're going to be like. This state. I'll have the real milk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how it's going to be. Cow's milk, this, please. This, no, I do believe it's going to be like that. That's what I'm saying. They're going to give you a piece of steak with a picture of the cow. This actually came from a real cow. This was not grown in a lab. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. This, this was alive. You know, and you you're like this is real. I I dude. do think it's going to get like that, dude. I really I I think it's going to get and it, for all good reasons though, right? To your point, like I think we're going to solve hunger. I think we're going to be able to get to a place where we can make so much food that at least people can survive off of it, mm -hmm. right? So they're not going to right. die from starvation and be able to feed the world, but then you're going to have this huge gap. You're going to have that stuff that's extremely cheap and that you could live off of and survive, which I think will be good for a lot of people that are in Dude, poverty. Are, yep. But then you're going to have, you know, oh, you no, want- I want real. So yeah. It would be cool to just have a cow as a pet. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> what are you going to do? They're just standing around. So you're around. Like, a, like a real boss then, yeah. huh? <laughs> Put a, you know, strap a, we, uh, something to yeah. ride it. We used to eat these before yeah. we grew it in a lab. It's yeah. going to be kind of weird. Cow right, races. Let's go way down now. Let's go to the future and let's get crazy with this. What What about when like this DNA you know, into bacteria technology becomes easily accessible now the average you know person with internet access can figure out how to do this. Now you can program bacteria to do all this stuff for yourself. So now rather well, than give me buying, an example, give me an example. Like of what? what we just said, like 
like tech theoretically, if this tech gets easily accessible to people and it's easy to do, people could do it themselves. Oh, I have yeah, I have a, a vat of bacteria in the back that makes casein and whey, and oh yeah, I grew some I grew some bacon in my 3D printer lab that, you know, it's yeah. like whatever. Dude, back to, it just seems like it's like the building block, you know, it's crazy. I still am convinced now that we are bacteria in a human suit. Well, I mean, we we are, <laughs> we're more, we have more bacteria cells than anything else, right? Uh, yeah. Aren't we? Yeah. Uh, or one-to-one. Or one. Yeah. It's one-to-one one or more. Oh, I thought it was more. We're, we're more like one-to-one. One. That's what Zach said. He said one, he said it's about as many bacteria cells as human cells. Oh, uh, see, I thought we were more. I thought I read that we were, we were more bacteria That's cells. That's what I used to think too. Yeah. But I thought he it was, I thought it was like three to one or something. That's crazy. what I used to quote. Uh, okay, but then he said one to one. So, mm. and he's the expert on it. So I'm gonna, okay. you know, I'm gonna listen Defer. to what, Fair what he says. All right, so more, <laughs> some more cool research. More studies have come out on the use of psilocybin to treat uh, depression, and it's blowing the doors off of anything we've ever done before nice. for treating mental disease. So this is huge. There's two companies, or one in particular, that is looking to make this into pharmaceutical. I think it's Compass Pathways is one. Mm -hmm. I'm invested in them. Yeah. So full disclosure, because I think that this this could potentially completely revolutionize uh, mental health treatments. Because there's nothing, if you look at these current studies, these new studies, nothing comes close to how these things seem to be in terms of their effectiveness. It's crazy for therapy, right? Like it's so promising with psilocybin, but also isn't there value to MDMA for like post-traumatic stress? I've seen some studies around that that are really encouraging as well. Aren't they similar to psilocybin though when it comes to therapy? Is, or is MDMA, are they so both psych used for different things? So psychedelic research refers to all these drugs, right? MDMA, psilocybin, LSD. Oh, okay. um, what's that other one, that tranquilizer? Oh, right. Uh, um God, what's that tranquilizer? I know exactly uh, what you're talking yeah, it's about. a horse tranquilizer, but yeah. you actually use it as anesthesia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't think of the name. Maybe Doug. We just talked it about it on the show the other day. I, know, I don't know I why know I can't. I can't remember. It's literally on the top of, tip of my tongue. Yeah. Anyway, Ugh. the studies are done on all of those uh, those drugs, and they're coming out and showing like lots of benefits. Psilocybin is probably one of the preferred ones because it's so safe. Mm -hmm. But I've also read studies on the other ones as well, and again, the results are are mind blowing. Like. It's like you have, you know, de like treatment resistant depression. You do therapy with psilocybin after a few sessions, your depression is relieved. Ketamine. And ketamine, thank yes. you. Yes. And you, you don't have to see, you don't have to go back for months. So it's like you do this therapy and you're you're cured for a long time. Yeah. Like six months or a year. Yeah, some of these are one session. That's what I thought. I thought the PTSD study they did was like 80 something percent, like one session, I thought. It was something crazy. Bro, like look that. at this. So yeah. here's a recent study, right? So the study found that patients who took a single psychedelic dose of psilocybin, 25 milligrams, in conjunction with therapy, by the way, this is very important. They're not just taking yeah, you're psychedelic. Like getting high yeah. and doing whatever. No. In fact, you can go in the opposite direction. You could have a bad experience and actually give yourself worse symptoms. But anyway, so it's in a controlled environment with a really good therapist. So they reported an almost immediate and significant reduction in depressive symptoms that lasted weeks compared with patients who were given a, a placebo, essentially. So 29 patient, patients, or 36.7%, who took the 25 milligram dose, showed a 50% or more reduction in symptoms in three weeks after the single dose, and again at three months. This is insane. 24% who took the highest dose were still in remission three months later. Can you think of any drug that treats this kind of depression yeah, that yeah. way gets those kind of numbers. Yeah, yeah. You, you do it like, like imagine if the future of you know mental health treatments is oh every ninety days I do a therapy session under the influence of psilocybin, which is extremely safe on the body. Well, weren't we moving in that direction? But then the seventies happened, and yes. it just became this thing they could target like certain groups of people to stop these protests. And then there it's were like, lots. We lost all the research. Lots of studies were done, were being done on psychedelics until they were labeled, you know, enemy number one or whatever. And uh, that was it. It all got shut down. Here's my only fear, right? So this is all done in a medical setting. You're a pharma company. Okay. You're still a company. You need to make a profit. So you have either antidepressants that people take every single day huge markup, right, big right. margins, yeah. or, the, or a one and done drug. Yeah. Or the, the three, money machine or you buy three pills a year yeah. because you go see the therapist once. And then like, that's the part that makes me go, huh? How's this going to work out? Yeah. Are they going to charge? Hopefully me? that gets disrupted. I mean, you got to imagine it with the, the metaverse. 
Well, how? What do you mean? Taking the psilocybin, going through your therapy on in a in a virtual setting. <laughs> Imagine how Come on, wicked that would be. That's going to fuck with your mind. Huh? Right Just as like, yeah, Come as on. like, I want to take shrooms and play video games. Yeah. That's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, just think about that. Take for a big, a second. big enough dose. That you don't need to go in the metaverse. My brain. Oh my god! I just can't. I can't imagine what that would be. You're like. already in the metaverse if you take a big yeah. enough dose. Yeah, yeah. That would be <laughs> There's wild. Smurfs everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hey. But I, I think it's remarkable, and I hope that the research continues, and I hope that they find a way to make it profitable because then it'll be easily accessible. Although I will say this, I'm not going to name any names, but I do know therapists, psych, uh, these are um, psycho not psychologists, but uh, psychotherapists and uh, psychiatrists who are working with some of these psychedelics kind of on the side because it's so effective. Yeah. And it's because they're like, it just works. Nothing works like this for some of these patients. Do you think mm -hmm. it'll get fast tracked because of uh, marijuana kind of paving the way right now? Or do you think because of the, because of like what you just brought up? I think up, the de decriminalization will. The use of it as a pharmaceutical they have to find a way to make it profitable. Otherwise, I don't know how we'll do it. Uh, you know how it'll get covered, or why why they'll invest in in developing these drugs necessarily. It has to be profitable. That's the problem. Now, where's decriminalized places like Oakland? Right, that's a yeah. place where it is. Are, are we seeing like these little pop up therapy type places? There must that, be clinics, yeah, that are servicing. People. Right. That's I don't. I, I'm not aware of. I any, have no idea. I mean, that are uh, on the up and up. Right. I've heard rumors of yeah. people that will do it with you and stuff like that, but I haven't heard of like somebody who's like advertising or that are promoting that they they will take you. Well, through. Well, isn't it Oregon? I think they're they're full blown legal, right? Like um, no, psilocybin? no, no. Still decriminalized. Oh, it's decriminalized. Yeah, they just decriminalize other drugs. That's what Oregon did, right? Oh, I thought Oregon they got all did, crazy. Took everything like, off the yeah. table. Going to the store and buy <laughs> and buy some. Yeah. No, I don't think so. You know what makes it makes me wonder if in the future, because we've talked about this a billion times, how much of you know sustaining weight loss and maintaining a good relationship with food and fitness is psychological. Oh, yeah. it's all psychological, right? I mean, that was always the challenge with clients. It's like, they know what to do. I've been helping you. I've been working with you, but you just, you have this really bad relationship with food or maybe you're using food as a way to self-medicate. Mm -hmm. And it's just, this is very challenging. What if downstream, some of these therapy sessions could be on other things besides the extreme stuff that we're seeing, which is like depression, PTSD. What if it was like, I'm obese, I can't figure this out, or I can't quit smoking, hmm. or I'm an alcoholic. Actually, I did see studies on alcoholism, and it, and it actually showed a, a pretty good effect. Yeah. What if it's like that? So you go to the doctor or your therapist, they give you psilocybin for pretty much any kind of challenge that you have, and then you come out of it, and you're like, you know what? I want to take care of it myself. It makes sense if it surfaces you know, something there that needs to be addressed that you've been avoiding, right? Yeah. And I know it's like effective in that regard. It'd be interesting to see if it had that same effect. Cause I know too, like some people do hypnotherapy and, yeah. and, and other treatments that are kind of unconventional and have had success, you know, being able to uh, break some addictions, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see if there has to, there has to be a little bit of a self-selection bias though, right now of like people that are willing to do this right now when it's gray market are really, I mean, if you are doing this now, like either one, you're, you have experience with that already or two, you're really seeking to to help yourself or grow, right? And so yeah, you got to be in that mindset. So right? I think that mindset going in probably has a lot to do with the outcome of it. Versus if it becomes so widely accepted, that everybody goes like, "Oh, I'll just go try that, and hopefully that'll fix me." And then the the work part isn't in there, or the desire to oh, really. I hear what you're saying. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So the people that are making the, that are doing this now are willing to are do desperate, the work. Right? I've been trying to figure this out, trying to wear, and they want to put now, the work a, in. There's a counter to that, yeah. right? The counter is that they are so far testing this on treatment resistant individuals. Like one of the hardest things mm. to treat in medicine is treatment resistant depression. So hard to work with and solve. So challenging. PTSD also. Yeah. Severe PTSD is so hard to work with and to help people. And it's like it's like it's such a torture. And the fact that they're showing these results on these treatment resistant, kind of challenging individuals makes me think that, you know, and what you're saying is very valid too. So that's interesting. I didn't even think of that. But I would guess that maybe we'd see even better results. Because now you're dealing with people who are more who aren't so extreme. They're not that severe. Mm. Maybe we'd see better. Yeah, know. but I feel like because of that, they they 
they treat it like it's no big deal and they yeah. don't go in with the same type of effort. I don't know. I just feel like everything else in our life, we've learned how the important of the, the journey, the hard and part, the, the hard part yeah. and the climbing them out and going through all that stuff. And if everybody can just fast track to fixing their obesity problem, fast track to fixing their depression by getting high one time, I just feel like you're going to see those, those percentages start to decrease. Yeah. That's not a bad point at all. Yeah, just yeah. my theory. I don't, I mean, cause it, it those numbers are so incredible. Um, that mm. I, I would have to think that there's there's probably people, and it's and it, it very, I mean, life-changing for those, but I bet those are people that have tried a lot of different things that have been working really hard mm -hmm. to probably try and fix it. And I think that attitude alone, going into something like that, that is opening up the yeah. mind and, and making those new so pathways. So I've been reading the theories on, and they know what's happening in the brain, right? It's opening new pathways. Yeah. It's getting different brain, parts it, of the brain to communicate. Yeah, sort of connecting other parts of the brain. But the way that they explained it was like was like this. Okay, so let's. I'm going to try and bring it back to what we've experienced working with clients. You're working with someone. They have an issue with obesity. Maybe it's a light. Let's, let's paint the picture. This person's dealt with uh, being overweight their whole life. So you have the client who is an overweight kid, overweight teen, overweight adult. Now they hire you and they're 40. Very challenging to get this person to change these behaviors. It's been how they've lived their entire life. Mm -hmm. Until they're willing to go deep and acknowledge those challenges and acknowledge why they have these things and face the pain, it's very hard to get them to change. So the theory behind a lot of these psychedelics is they make you, they open you up to the point where you're okay, you forgive yourself and you face your pain. Like I was reading one on, on PTSD and one of the challenges is getting this, like let's say the soldier who has PTSD to, to walk through what happened, mm -hmm. go through it and not be like angry with themselves and what did I do, but rather forgive themselves and be open. And that's the big part of why they think, some people think mm. these things are so effective. So that part right there makes me hopeful. Yeah, and you'd think that uh, some of these government programs would get behind it because, like, even my dad, like, as he was in uh, Vietnam, like, how they got exposed to Agent Orange, uh, and it was, like, such a, a problem way later on. Yeah. But, I mean, besides the trauma and everything else of just being in war, uh, just, just to, like, him having to go to these treatments, and then they have to, like, cover that, these insurance companies, you know, from the vet's, uh, side like you'd think that this would be something that it's proven it's got a track record it, it works like saves money saves money yeah. because the, there's so many different visits you need to yeah. to take to kind of treat you know, more, more more soldiers die from suicide now than from from war yeah yeah it's been like that now for a little while what, little. what has been the the latest i mean what's been the latest big news in this space i mean you brought up a while back with the decriminalization in some of these states but has there been anything else that we've made like huge headway like a lot of stuff we're talking about right now we've kind of known for a little bit now yeah no the biggest one was uh there was a company let me see if i can find the name that had that created a synthetic version of psilocybin oh, um right. the company is called c uh Cybin. Cybin, very inexpensive. I invested in them too because I thought this is interesting. Good way to hedge your bet. Yeah, and what they did is they created a a drug that was like psilocybin, but obviously a pharmaceutical makes it easy to patent and whatever. And they also had positive results. From so it. they so, could yeah concentrate it, have replicable dosage. So it's like because I I would imagine that if you need to get mushrooms, you don't really know. Uh, the potency of it, like oh no, oh no, no, they standardize good, it. I was gonna say that's a good question too. Is like is is psilocybin similar to like marijuana, where the the same same size of a mushroom could be dramatically yes. stronger or weaker yes, than but, another? But when they do these in studies, they they standardize the psilocybin, so they're giving you. So when they grow, they, the whole process is the same. It's gonna they, have the same result. Then they yes, varies? they take out the psilocybin. And then they make sure you get the exact same dose as the next person. So they're not just giving you a mushroom to eat yeah. where you could get a higher dose or a lower dose. Right. They're standardizing uh, the dose. Okay. So now the reason why a, a synthetic version is interesting is because now you can patent it. Well, yeah. So you psilocybin grows naturally. Yeah. So they have to find creative ways to patent it. And relatively their, inexpensive too, right? Well, I mean, it grows on cow shit. Yeah. Right. For, for free. Yeah. Again, back to the cows. Hey, real quick, I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Look, if you're watching this podcast, if you're watching the show or listening to the show, you're very interested in your health, you're interested in nutrition and fitness. Now, here's one of the challenges that people run into when they increase their protein intake and they're trying to eat healthy. Sometimes they encounter some gastro issues, high protein diets. Sometimes your digestion needs to acclimate. It can cause some issues. Maybe what can help you are digestive enzymes. Now, I use them regularly. 
They help me with my gut issues. I don't get gas from lots of protein. I break down my vegetables and my starches much better. It also helps my body assimilate these foods. So I'm utilizing more of them for the things that I want them to go to, like muscle growth and less to maybe body fat storage, although that has to do with calorie surpluses. When your body is inflamed from poor digestion, it can move hormones and your body in a direction that is unfavorable. Digestive enzymes can definitely help. And the best place to get digestive enzymes is Masszymes. They make digestive enzymes for fitness people. Go check them out. Head over to masszymes.com. That's M A S S Z Y M E S dot com forward slash mind pump. And then use the code mind pump 20 for 20% off. All right. Enjoy the rest of the show. First question is from Alex Ewan. From your experience, how much muscle could an average genetics beginner put on in a year, assuming they're following a MAPS program? Really good question. <laughs> Way more range. than other programs. Great I'll commercial for that. MAPS. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Okay. So if, okay. Good programming. Low end good. 40, high end 60 pounds, somewhere on there. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <Wow. laughs> wow, Not true. That's a bold statement. <laughs> okay. So let's say you got a good workout program. So it's appropriate for your body. It's geared towards building muscle. You got good sleep, good diet, average genetics. I would say it's probably realistic in terms of lean body mass in the first year for a man to probably gain anywhere between, I don't know, 10 to 15 pounds of lean body mass in the first year. I think about All things that. being equal. I think mm -hmm. that's, do you guys, what do you guys think? Oh, I think that's, uh, that's sort of for, if you're talking about a brand new beginner, I think that's uh, very realistic. I think you could see even higher numbers than that. I mean, uh, professional bodybuilders would say that uh, if they could add 10 pounds of muscle in a year, that's like, Amazing. But they're already so big and right. Buffed and yeah. Things. Well, and they've also been training for a long, long time and taking everything already in their yeah. son. But when you're new, boy, it, it kind of it comes on pretty quick. So and I, that's you know, lean muscle. That's not just overall mass, which I think a lot of people get. Uh, they lump all that in together in terms of what they've gained. So yeah, yeah. we're talking just the lean muscle. Yeah, I would say ten to fifteen 10 is pretty reasonable. Ten to fifteen in in about a year, the first year with everything being good. For women, it's probably more like uh, I don't know four to eight, uh, probably roughly half. Um, and then each year after that, you'll probably slow down uh, in terms of your gains. Now here's the thing, okay. All things being equal, boy, is there a wide variance in genetics. So I have yeah. I know people that have gained 30 pounds of lean body mass their first year of training, and these are just genetic yeah, they're freaks. Just freaks yeah. And then I know other people where it's like five, and he got, you know, men, where it's like four pounds of lean body mass in a year, yeah. and that first year is really, really challenging. So it can really make a big difference. Well, I think uh, the, most of the, the, uh, the stuff that I've read is between a half a pound to a pound, like on the good end, right? On the high right. end, a half a pound to a pound of muscle a week. If everything is dialed in- A and, week? Yeah. Oh my God, that would well, be- that's, that's two pounds a month, well, a two to four pounds a month. It's what you just said. 48 would be primo for 56 weeks, but the re reality of that's not- Then maybe initially, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So- and that's, I mean, again, that's the high end, uh, what someone could potentially anticipate. Well, I think there's also that novel sort of window if you're a beginner, right? You get those sort of new gains uh, for the first few weeks, for the first few months, and you can kind of like, you know, get a real good jump start. I, I it's, would, all, it's all relative to, to but it your, depends on genetics, your actual size already too. So someone yeah. who is a 200 pound man yeah, could gain uh, 20 pounds and it's not that big of a deal. A That's guy, 10%, right? Yeah, exactly. A guy who's 100, 120 pounds, uh, total different story. So, I mean, it, you're, it depends on the size, depends on the genetic. Yeah, so yeah. there is a wide variance here, but you could put on a decent amount of muscle in... I know as a, as a young lifter, I know there was there, at least a, a year there where I had a good 10 to 15 pound you know, gain in a What in was a your year. best year? Probably something like that. Yeah, yeah probably too. something 10 to 15 pounds. My best year was... Not, non anabolics right? So, like, obviously, right. I've had mm -hmm. bigger jumps when I was on steroids, but uh, naturally, yeah, probably 10 to 15 pounds. Mine was when be. I was 16, and I gained, like, over the summer, I gained about, uh, on the scale, 14 pounds. I don't know yeah. if that was... I'm sure it wasn't all lean body mass, but that was over a summer. As a 16-year-old kid, I got stretch marks in my legs and in my armpits. But it's uh, genetics play a big role. And also, when you're a beginner, the muscle gains kind of look like this. It's almost like a bell curve. At first, your strength goes up quite quickly, but you don't gain muscle very quickly. And that's from central nervous system adaptation. And you're learning the exercises. Yeah. You're learning how to do them properly. So you're not really able to maximize the benefit you get from them. So it starts off from a muscle gain perspective 
a bit slow, and then it ramps up, and then it kind of peaks, and then it starts to slow down again. So it's like if I got a new client that was otherwise healthy, you know, you know, in an, you know, let's say the age range of twenty to forty, and they're doing everything right. It's usually after the second month that we would start to see the muscle gains really start to, to, to come on. You know? Well, don't you think, though, too, like they hit that inevitable sort of tapering off and plateau because they're not thinking ahead in terms of changing the stimulus up and, and you know, the programming and addressing that. The, uh, I think a lot of times that like, you just feel like you're, you're making all this progress and you mm -hmm. stay within that same uh, sort of protocol, whereas this is something that we really were intentionally drawing up uh, with the MAPS programs. Yeah, I read um, another article that said that the average man over the course of a long period of time with good training, good diet, would, could gain naturally roughly 20 pounds of lean body mass above their what their body would normally carry. Yeah. So that was the the, the number that I read. So if, if your lean body mass sits around 160, after you know four or five years of good training, being consistent, you could probably carry an additional. I mean, this would be an lean. awesome commercial for us. I mean, I'd love to have somebody who like yeah. owns like four or five programs, right? Because that's what it would take to get all the way through a year, and and changes up the stimulus every three months, right? New program, mm -hmm. stays tight mm -hmm. on their diet, and is a, a new lifter, and then reports back, right? You do your body fat test before just to see kind of your baseline. Do something that's consistent, whatever one you decide to do. And then test at the end of the year. It'd be really interesting to see what that would be. I'd love to. Like I'd a love lean to hear muscle, somebody. Uh, yeah, sort of competition. Yeah, I, I think I think ten to fifteen is uh, very very likely. I think it's you'll see. I some, think it's realistic. It's yeah. realistic. Yeah, it's because, in reality. Okay, okay, likely is is hard because how many pe beginners do you know? For a well, year. Okay, yeah, but we're we're assuming that, right? Yes, we're assuming yes. they are doing a calorie increase, right? We're assuming as they start to build, they slowly continue to increase they calories. Got a good workout program, right? They're well, they're following maps, right? They're following maps all the way yeah. through for an they're entire year. Quit recovery. They're yeah, they're well, which it's built into the programming, yep. right? So they're following maps perfectly for a whole entire year. They are eating accordingly, meaning that as they gain muscle, they're continuing to scale the caloric intake up from where it was before, mm -hmm. and they do that consistently for an entire year. I think 10 to 15 is more than realistic. Yeah. I think you should expect that uh, for if you're doing all things. Yeah, right? yeah I would I'd love agree. to see yeah somebody squeeze that even further, like see how far you go. Oh, I, I had someone, see. I had some, I mean, I got DMs all the time. I had a yeah. guy gain 20, you know, yeah. and yeah. he's probably up a little bit better on the genetic standpoint. He was young, he was in his 20s. Uh-huh. But he gained uh, 20 pounds of, uh, of, I think, almost all lean body mass. His body fat percentage, in fact, stayed the same. I think he only gained a couple pounds of body fat with that. So I've, I've seen it um, from some of our people. You know what's funny is the longevity effects uh, that they're measuring from muscle are really coming from the strength. Mm -hmm. So it's the strength increases that they've connected to longevity, not necessarily muscle. But strength is a great way to correlate to muscle. So just a right. side note. Next question is from Kenzie Benzie double zero. Are tricep kickbacks effective? The internet says they're canceled. You, you know what's funny? <laughs> I like that. Kenzy Benzy. One of my, okay, here's one of my favorite things about canceled. following uh, resistance training and exercise for as long as I have. Exercises are like, it's like clothes. They fall into fashion, they fall out of fashion. Into right. fa In the 90s, it was super unpopular to squat. Nobody freaking squatted. Everybody leg pressed and hack squatted. Now everybody's starting to squat again. Deadlifts didn't exist. Nobody deadlifted in the gym unless you were a power lifter. Overhead presses were all behind the neck with a barbell. Nobody did mm -hmm. military presses like, like we talk about now. Tricep kickbacks have been popular, unpopular, popular, unpopular. Do I think they have value? I absolutely think they have value. Would I put them in the same category as like dips or close grip bench presses or skull crushers? No. But if you do a, a proper tricep kickback where you really pull the elbow up real high, pin it to your side, and then focus on that squeeze when you bring the dumbbell up to, almost nothing will cramp your tricep like a mm. tricep kickback because of the shortened position of where See, your elbow I mean, is. you could easily convince me it's worthless. So. As this, so I'll, here, you're going to like my analogy. If we're going to stick with the clothing a, analogy, okay, if we're going to exercise. stick with your, your clothing yeah, analogy no, I, of falling I, I, in I and out I want to hear favor, you guys out, though. Listen, if we're going to stick out. to the clothing analogy that the, the, these things fall in and out of favor and the tricep kickback is something like that, then the tricep kickback is the chums of uh, clothing or apparel. Mm. Uh, you could do without them. They're I not that big. I don't even know what chums are. Chums are the ones that go on yeah, your sunglasses. Hold your sunglasses. Yeah. Yeah. Nice accessory. We we're cool for a little right. while. They actually still sell them. I took yeah. a picture at a gas station. Okay. I saw them being sold. Okay, Great, no, I'm, like <laughs> early '90s reference. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm gonna make my. I'm gonna make my case. Okay, tricep kickbacks. I put it in the same category as, 
you know, uh, cable press downs with the rope, uh, like those types of what bodybuilders call finishing exercises. If you've done at the end of your workout a really a, a really well done tricep kickback, and it's really important you keep your elbow high, pin at your side, and focus on full squeeze. Almost nothing will cramp your tricep like that. I swear to God, try well, it. Well, I mean, I guess if cramping the, the tricep is what builds muscle, then that would be no, a good point. No, come on. Don't be a smart ass. <laughs> try it and, and see for yourself. It is it is it's, it. it's, it's like not dog a worthless. Piece. It's on that level. For I mean, me. I it's would, not I, a worthless. Hey, I went on a kick for a long time. I was all into them, and it was probably in the uh, early 2000s. The arms was, version was of them, But yeah, I don't know. They don't They don't make it. I can't tell you how, how long. And, and if I were to do them now, okay, if I were to do them, which you won't probably catch me doing them, um, I would actually do them on a cable and not a dumbbell. I really think they're worthless with a dumbbell. So most people let their elbow drop too much. They use momentum. You've got about a the six inch of window of movement where it's actually effective well, at all. That's why it's such a different feel when yeah. you do it with a dumbbell. It's all about the squeeze. When oh, you see, hold think, it way up there, oh my god! I it's, think it's it's, 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 yeah, it's canceled in my book. I, I would definitely, <laughs> well, if I was going to do it, I'd grab probably like one of those single ropes. Yes, and, and then I would pull back with the. Yeah. So that way, you least are keeping the, consistent there's more tension on it yeah. the entire time right. through the movement. Uh, yeah, no, it's not a. I think it's it's not canceled. There's no, all, it's, I mean, it's one of those. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those pumping exercises, like the other ones that I don't really have people a dog do. In this fight. Look, I tell you what, try them out. Here's the deal: with your elbow far back and pinned to your side, so your elbow is literally higher than your body. The long head of the tricep is shortened. Then on top of it, you squeeze like crazy at the top. It's an interesting feel that I haven't really replicated with almost any other exercise. I'm not saying. I mean, you're getting that elbow position in a dip. No, you're not. You're not getting it at the top. What I'm talking about is that full squeeze at the top with the elbow higher than your body. It's a very shortened position for the, right, for the so your long elbow's head. still up, but you're locked out. You don't get that in a lot of movements. No, you don't. Yeah. Now with that full squeeze, it's, it feels very interesting. Now again, I'm not placing it in the category. It, it's it. You'll find it in I think one of our workout programs, maybe as a focus session. Did we? Maybe yeah, it's a focus I think session. It's, it's aesthetic. probably an aesthetic or, or a split, but yeah, it's it's definitely in there as just like your single joint. Like this is we're hyper focused yeah. on just the tricep, like any angle possible. Right? Yes, but it's not canceled. I think it's got some value. It's got value like <laughs> other pumping exercises <laughs> yeah. do. It's not canceled. I mean, like there's just, if we were to go back to how we always talk about an order of operation of exercises, you know, as far as all the tricep exercises that are out there, it is towards the bottom, uh, if not the very bottom of tricep exercise. In fact. Give me a tricep exercise that's worse. Oh, easy. Supinated grip pushdowns. Easy. Well, what? Because you're comparing it to pronated, and that's just, correct. That's just the way. How many tricep exercises oh, you see? Flipping where they're, your wrist position. Yeah, they're yeah. changing the wrist position, doing all this other stupid stuff. No, no, it's, it's better really than about that. Where the elbow is. Yeah, yeah, if if you're if you do three exercises for your triceps, and the last one is a finisher where you're getting a pump, swap it out I for kickbacks. That. That, try it man. out. Do the squeeze at the top. Go light. Hold the squeeze at the top. Watch what happens. I feel like he's defending it just because he was doing it like two days ago. That's <laughs> he, why. He actually, I haven't finished, finished it today. I saw he was in the gym. Yeah. yeah. He's doing that. And then what's this one called where you go like sideways? Yeah, that's the. What are you doing? Uh, what's Do that his again, name? Justin? No, I can't because it looks that's like. That's the uh, Michael or Hearn. The Michael no, Hearn no, where he no. flares <laughs> <flips, laughs> the elbows out. And I'm he not doing it. anything, but I'm trying to emulate. I have a dumbbell right here and I'm yeah, coming the inside of my handle. chest. <laughs> and then I'm extending I mean, it we've, we've said this before. No exercise is technically a, a worthless exercise and everything has some sort of value. If you work out all the time and you. Do a lot. You've done all the tricep movements, and mm -hmm. you never do tricep kickbacks. Would I concede this argument? Like, okay, yeah, okay, you could you could go there. Just, I think that the, it'd be hard for me to name an exercise, and I don't like your reverse grip tricep pushdowns because if you did that and you didn't do pronated, it's not a bad movement. It's just a silly movement. If you do <laughs> pronated, then it's a silly movement. No, I, th I think it's I think it's, it's stupid. I, I, I look. I'll tell you what. I, I haven't done them. Look, full disclosure. I haven't done them in a long time, but I have done them in the past. And they use the word canceled. No, it's not canceled for a pump and for a squeeze as the last exercise in your you know group of exercises for triceps. I think it's got some value. Will it replace dips, close grip bench presses, you know, skull crushers, overhead triceps? I mean, do you got another no. exercise besides that reverse grip push down that it's not that it's not worse than all the cable weirdness that people do for triceps? Oh, I do it this way. I do it this way. I do it this way. I grab a rope. I grab a bar. Like, okay, what's really important with triceps? Elbow position. 
yeah. right? In front of your body, over your head, down by your sides. Name a tricep exercise where the elbow's behind your body almost. Well, yeah, not at the, the peak because you you start there in the dip, right? In the dip, your elbow. But you don't finish with your there. elbow up at the, at the, in that back position. Yeah, I mean, you can make that, you can make that case. Yeah. But, um, so Sal, yeah, it, Sal won, everyone else did. So I don't know <laughs> if you won. I don't think it's you won very, this <laughs> argument, bro. <laughs> this is, no, it's still it's, on the, the you, just above worthless like, Yeah, exactly. You named dude. one exercise, and yeah. I would make the case that if you'd never do a pronated push down, that a reverse yeah. push down is not bad. I don't know. All I yeah. want is Andrew to put in here a score. Sal won. Everyone else did. You get like a point of a point. <laughs> Next question is from Hannah Fit Lift. Is it possible to get stronger while eating at maintenance? Yeah, totally, well, man. of course. Strength yeah. is a, is a skill. I, I've gotten stronger, not added any muscle at all, just because I was able to fire better and just control the weight better and have better skill and technique yeah. with it. Well, the this is where a lot of the central nervous system doesn't come into the conversation. Yeah. We've we've tried our best to kind of describe it, which is hard to do. Uh, to people, but really like just going through that process of being able to recruit and intrinsically like produce more force uh, creates a stronger uh, situation where you can now have access to, to more strength than you did before, but uh, not necessarily, you're not going to gain size uh, necessarily. Well, that's why I've always loved the analogy that Sal gave because I never heard it before we all got together, which was the, the speaker and amplifier mm -hmm. analogy. And I think it just works in so many examples. It works here again. If you are put, if you're investing in your your amplifier to get more power to your speakers, you don't necessarily need more calories or more strength. You get better skill at a movement, and you're increasing your amplifier. You're yeah. making your amp better, the which juice. is juice. Yeah, so you don't necessarily need to have higher calorie to do that, and or add a bunch more muscle in order to get a bigger amplifier for your muscles. And I just that's why I love that analogy because that's an example, in my opinion, of the CNS here. Is that mm -hmm. you by practicing and getting the movement down really well, you are investing in a better, stronger amplifier for your speakers. I'll give you an example that completely illustrates what we're talking about. If you take two groups of people and you already know what their maxes are, nobody's gaining any extra muscle, and then they go and test their maxes again, but you give half of them caffeine and the other half no caffeine, you will see a statistically significant, you know, maybe 5% or 3% increase in strength in the group that took caffeine. D did the caffeine make them build more muscle? No, caffeine is a CNS stimulant. So it just got their CNS to fire harder and they were stronger. Can you do this without taking supplements or chemicals? Yeah, you can yep. train your CNS. You know, when they do studies on Olympic weightlifters, Olympic lifters are, they can, they can summon something like 95% of their actual potential. Mm -hmm. So you have a 160-pound Olympic lifter. Because of the way they train. Have you ever seen that? Because we've talked about this, yes. right? We've touted that before. Have you ever seen that compared to what the average person average is? Average person is something like 40 to 50. Is it yeah. really that yeah. low? Yeah, I, I They're not it was, even come close to actualizing no, their potential. In order for the average person to generate their true potential of strength, they have to be under extreme stress situations. This is like the oh, story the of like adrenaline or yeah, it sort of overrides a lot of the governing uh, that's in place. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that yourself where you're like, you're in danger, your kid's in danger and you yeah. do something and afterwards like, like for me, I definitely lift weights and stuff. So I'm sure I'm higher on the, on that range than, than the average person. But I by no means train like an Olympic lifter. And I definitely don't train plyometrics and explosive power. I, I do a little bit now because of Justin's influence. Didn't do in the past. But I'll never forget my son, my oldest, now he was two at the time. He was at the top of the stairs mm -hmm. and he was saw me mm -hmm. and he was just ready to jump off the top. And I leaped, mm -hmm. I grabbed the rail, I ripped it off the wall and leaped to the top of the stairs and caught him. No way I could have done that naturally. You couldn't have paid me to do it. Uh, yeah. And I pulled a lat like and bionic. Yeah, I did the same thing. My, my son was falling down the hill. Same yeah. thing. I pulled my hamstring really bad because it just, boom, I, yep. I you know exploded. And that's why your body doesn't let you do that. It's got yeah. those governors. But yeah, you could totally, if you just get better at a lift, you can lift more without gaining any muscle. Now, is that beneficial to building muscle? Yes. Because as you lift better and you get stronger because you lift better, now you're able to apply more stress to the muscle and get more out of that exercise. Well, this is why the advice that we give so often to people is just, you know, look at your workouts, go to the work gym and just practice. 
just practice and get good at the movement because that in itself, forget adding weight to the bar and yep. trying to sweat harder and increase intensity. Just go practice getting good at the movement and watch the carryover you'll get from You know, that. there was a Soviet method of training that did that where they would take athletes and let's say the athlete could squat, uh, let's say they could squat 315 for 20 reps, for example. They would have the person squat 315 for like 15 reps or 10 reps every day even if they got stronger. So 10 reps at one point kind of feels like, oh, I could do another 10, but then the mm -hmm. next few times like, whoa, I feel like I could do 25. 30. They kept them doing that for three months and then they would test their max and you'd see this huge boost yeah. in strength. And it was all because they were practicing. Next question is from Kev Petrushen. Why is it that some PT certification companies focus significantly on the idea of VO2 max as the greatest indicator of health and tool for program training. Because that's that's what the studies center around. Yeah. So one of the challenges uh, that I have with a lot of certification courses uh, is also a lot of their strengths, which is they focus heavily on data. And when you look at the studies on physical performance and health, there's lots of studies done on VO2 max and endurance very little studies done on strength. And they're all, all athlete driven, which yeah. has no real relation to like everyday average people. Yeah. So it's so, also very, it, it's one variable that you're looking at yeah. versus like was measuring strength. Sounds like muscles. cholesterol. Yeah. Like yeah. Just, but there's measure. a lot of moving parts when it comes to that. Like as far as somebody's, my, somebody's rest could have been good for a day. So their strength is down or up. Like, so things like that. Well, we do, we do now have studies on strength and they are very simple. They use a grip strength test and it's actually a better predictor of all cause mortality than other single metrics. It's my favorite way to do it. But it's just, there were no tests. Like there were no studies. All the studies were done on stamina and endurance. If, if, you, were, if you were a research in the 1990s or before, and you wanted to study the correlation between physical fitness and longevity, yeah. you would almost always pick some type of an endurance metric. So there's a lot of studies that are done on that. There's very few done on you know, flexibility or strength. Although now we're starting to see a lot on strength and starting to show that there's a huge uh, connection between strength and longevity. So this is why they do that. Now, here's the flaw in that. You're training average everyday people and you're a new trainer and all you're looking at is VO2 max and you ignore <clears throat> mobility. You ignore, you know, strength. You ignore how able, how, how well they are able to fire particular muscles and posture in movement because you're just focused on VO2 max plus training VO2 max is a bit inappropriate for a lot of clients, right? Like mm -hmm. if I have a 60 year old client who's never exercised, like <laughs> probably not a good idea to push them to max out their VO2. It's also really easy to manipulate and to improve. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you guys have read the stuff mm -hmm. on like you could improve your VO2 max every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every day you can improve it. It's and a pretty fast adaptation. Yeah. It's a very fast adaptation. So it's like, I don't know. I'd rather focus on something that I think that's going to take a little bit more skill, more time and better behaviors and get that in my client before. I mean, I could put them on two weeks of every day doing some intense cardio. And by the end of two weeks, we're going to have a huge difference in their VO2. Well, max. I mean, what's the most protective? And we've seen multiple right. studies now coming out about, you know, muscle being like one of the best things to pursue because of the strength and uh, the protective qualities it has for all kinds of things, you know, even with, uh, you know, pr prevention of disease, you yep. know, protects your organs, yep. like so many uh, benefits to that. And then also just like eliminating aches and pains for the long haul versus like you focus on cardiovascular output, um, you know, that repetitive stress, that oxidative stress, all that stuff accumulates. And if that's your only focus, like you're going to end up in a, in a bad position. Yeah. To be fair, um, improve in any metric of physical health within a particular range, right? So we're not going extreme. We'll, so improve your endurance or improve your mobility or improve your strength. Like all those things are going to improve your health um, and your longevity. So to be fair, they all contribute. But sure. here's the part that gets very challenging is there's other things that they sometimes don't include in the studies. For example, if you get stronger, you're less likely to lose your balance and fall. So... I'd like to see a study that shows uh, the correlation or connection between strength and falling down and breaking your hip. Or how exactly. about pain? If you get stronger, you're less likely to have pain, which means you're less likely to take pain medications, which have their own negative side Those effects. Are two major factors. That can cause issues, right? So it's, a, it's, it's much more complicated. Um, and also, if you really want a good indicator of health, 
you're never going to use one metric anyway. Even strength is by itself is flawed. You want to mm-hmm. look at multiple metrics to right. give you a, like a, a whole picture and then look at behaviors and quality of life. One of the reasons why we work with NCI, for example, is NCI actually takes that into account. They really take into account behaviors and context of the client. They're not, they're very science focused, but then they're also like, but also, also look at the person. Also consider what they're going to be consistent doing, what they enjoy, what their quality of life is, and what it can potentially mean downstream. And then here's how you apply it to this particular individual. I think that's so important. And a lot of certifications miss that because they just go off of uh, the research. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. We actually wrote a bunch of guides to help you with all kinds of fitness goals. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 